Welcome to another episode of Beyond Risk and Back. I am your host, Aaron Huey. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for listening, liking, subscribing, sharing. And of course, if you love the show, leave us a review. It does help us get in front of other parents who are struggling, have the questions. It gets us in front of teachers and clinicians who are just looking to support their work and their practice. And as always, to that end, I have another spectacular guest today. I have had Dr. Bissell on before, the leading reading coach in the United States, in North America. I've got him back today. He's working on a project that's making huge strides in Ireland, in India. We're going to get him to talk about that. We're also going to get him to discuss this cyberbullying and online behavior of our children that leads into what he was telling me off the air, pretty difficult habits to change in our teenagers. So definitely we're going to brainstorm with him on how can we change some of the more embedded habits. Doctor, I will say that there was something you said the last time we spoke, and maybe this will get us started, that I want to bring up here because it utterly floored me, made me speechless. And for someone who loves the sound of his own voice, that's very rare. I was asking you about how do we get these teenagers to read? And you were like, they are reading all day long. Don't they text each other? Aren't they writing shorthand? Aren't they constantly? And I was like, Oh my God. And one of the biggest feedback, your the last episode, Doctor, we did together was very popular, but the biggest feedback I got on your episode uh, was parents were starting to turn on the subtitles on YouTube. And they're saying, you can watch YouTube, but you got to turn on the subtitles. And the kids had no problem saying yes. And guess what they're reading? So Dr. Brussel, thank you for being back. You're a great guest. I'm so pleased to have you there and welcome. Thanks so much for having me back, Aaron. Thanks for spreading some positivity around the world. We we are sorely in need of your enthusiasm. I, I just love it. So I, I feel very honored to be asked back. Well, thank you. Let's jump in right away. I want to give the the parents who are hearing you for the first time a brief overview on the who, what, and why of Danny here. What is it? Where? How did you end up here? Why are you doing this? And who the heck are you? Yeah, I, I, I ask those questions myself, and I, I have to bring you. <laughs> I have to bring you home with me so you can tell all these things to my wife. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, my name is Danny Brussell. My last name's really easy to remember how to spell. It's spelled like Braz Cell. No, I never took any grief over that when I was a child. And I'm on a mission to bring joy back into education in the workplace. I do that in four different ways. First of all, I speak over 100 dates a year all around the world, primarily to schools, but also to companies on how to boost the positive energy in the workplace. Second of all, I have the world's top online reading engagement program, which in just over two months shows parents very practical tips like the one you just were talking about, uh, turning the subtitles on the TV. In just over two months, we'll get kids to read more, read better, and most importantly, to love reading. And the reason that's a passion of mine is I think schools do a, an adequate job of teaching kids how to read. But the question I always ask people is, what good is it teaching a kid how to read if they never want to read? I teach kids why to read because I've never had to tell a, a kid, go watch TV. I've never had to tell a kid, go play a video game. And I never want to have to tell a kid, go read. I want them to choose to do it on their own because they love it. And there are simple strategies that I share with people on how to do that. Third, I work with uh, entrepreneurs, small business owners, and executives around the world on how to create uh, powerful presentations that get their audience to take the next step, whether that's to purchase their products or to uh, invest in their idea or to donate to their cause. And then finally, and this is what you and I were talking before we were on air, uh, my real passion is I've been privileged to be working with uh, Cyber Smarties, which is a company created in 2015 by Dermot Hudner in Ireland. It's basically a social media platform for kids ages 5 to 12, which uh, basically trains kids how to use social media in a positive way. Social media and the internet, they just kind of happened. And what happens when things just happen is there's no training involved. And of course, we always go to the lowest common denominator. And that's why you see all this negativity online. For example, I was working with a school district a couple of weeks ago, and the speaker before me made all the parents in the audience take a pledge that their kids wouldn't be on cell phones until eighth grade. And everybody applauded. And I kind of felt like a worm for doing this. But I said, well, I don't think that's education. I think that's putting your head in the sand because the fact is that whether we like it or not, kids are going to be on cell phones. Kids are going to be on social media. And I don't 
own a gun, but if the school was arming all of our kids with guns, I would really hope that they train the kids on how to safely use a gun. And that's what we're doing with the internet and with social media is we show kids how to use these in a positive manner, which is great. With program began in 2015 in Ireland. By 2016, the National Police Force of Ireland contacted Dearmid to find out what was going on because they had seen a huge decrease in online predator activity as well as cyberbullying. And it's the only social media platform in the world that has been endorsed by a national police force. And now they've actually been endorsed by two national police forces, uh, Ireland and New Zealand. And uh, New Zealand, in one of the schools, uh, Cyber Smarties was placed in, within 24 hours, they saw a 99% drop in cyberbullying. <laughs> Good Lord. But it's because all of us, whether we're kids or we're our age, uh, Aaron, we're a product of our environment. When people are yelling and you think that that's the, w- the right way to act, everybody starts yelling. I was taught, I remember uh, Sister Teresa in second grade, basically, she said something always stuck with me. She said, well, if you're yelling, you must be losing your argument. And I always remembered that even when I was eight years old, I'm like, huh, the people that are yelling usually don't really have anything to support themselves with. And we had this conversation earlier. The thing that I love about you and everybody we should be celebrating that we're all different. I love that people think differently than me. That's how I learn. If everybody thought the same as me, well, first of all, we'd be in a lot of trouble. But second of all, I, I would never learn anything. I, I actually appreciate all this all the time, but we need to learn how to be able to disagree with one another in a respectful, kind way. And uh, that's that's why I'm really excited about that. It's the same thing as when I'm teaching kids to read. I, I think last time we were talking, uh, one of my websites, uh, the Lazy Readers Book Club, lazyreaders.com. It's a free subscription. Once a month for the rest of your life, I update it with 10 book recommendations, three or four adult level, three or four young adult level, and three or four children's level books, all under 250 pages. So you have something you can read when you're stuck in the doctor's office. Every month when I'm looking for book recommendations, it's getting tougher and tougher for me to find anything for teens that's in any way positive. I I go to the bookstore and every teenage book is about date rape and alcohol abuse and uh, dystopian society. I'm like, no wonder, no wonder the the teenagers are so screwed up. That's what they're reading all the time. Like you're a product. It's, it's kind of like uh, a friend of mine's a, a veterinarian. And he always asked me, this is a good question. He says, well, how do you treat a sick fish? I'm like, I don't know. How do you treat a sick fish? He says, you, you take it and you put it in a different tank of water. You change the environment. It's the same thing with all of us. Is how do you treat? How do you how do you teach people how to be more positive? Well, you get them out of that negative environment and you put them in a positive one. So that's a very long answer to your short question. <laughs> you know, it's kind of nuts because it is something you just said about the environment. We've got kids in school environments where you know once every now and then they they have to practice the run hide fight drills for for live shooting we we've got anti smoking it's going to kill you cancer pictures all over everybody's walls books are being stripped out of their library out of fear and we have uh by god don't litter climate change your world's coming to an end and somewhere in the school hallway there's going to be a be positive and nice to each other <laughs> And I like so. Which is it? And they're they're based on your your expertise. I feel like there's three topics we need to cover for the parents on this show. The first being cyberbullying. The second being access to to truth. Uh, and the third being predatorial online behavior. Being able as a parent to identify um, how predators do it. Like, what are some of the things they do and what can we look out for? And it, doctor, are we, you know, you, this this program that, that you're helping spread into North America, you start kids at the age of five. Is that when we have to start talking to them about predators? Oh, I'd, I'd start even earlier than that. I mean, the world is, uh, you know, I love rainbow glasses, but the, the world is a tough place. And uh, it, it disgusts me. I mean... My sister's in law enforcement. All my uncles are in law enforcement and listening to some of the things that they have to deal with. It's absolutely despicable. And um, yeah, it's important to have those conversations. And so Cyber Smarties, what's great about it is it's a fully monitored, safe platform for kids and only kids are allowed on it. So every kid is verified by the school to be an actual child. There are no adults 
on there. The only adults we have are our online. We have actual adult monitors watching what the kids are saying to one another. That way they can flag. Uh, the way it works is when the kids are in the chat room, let's say I type a message to you. I'm like, Aaron, I think you are ugly and stupid. Well, it won't let me send the, the message. Instead, it gets a pop-up says, that's not a nice thing to say to Aaron. What's a nice thing? And so it makes me change the word ugly. Well, then it doesn't let me continue because it's going to make me also change the word stupid. The reason we did this, I mean, we could block those words. That's simple enough, but we don't do that because that's not teaching. We're trying to educate the kid on what a, a proper terminology is. Now, if the system doesn't pick up a bad word, because some kids are a little bit more clever, you know, because uh, instead of calling you ugly, I could say you look like a donkey. Well, the system's not going to pick up the word donkey. That's why we have a human monitor that can flag that immediately. Or the kid that's receiving the message can also report that. And when they report it, it's great because it's also going to ask the kid, well, why are you reporting this? What What's wrong with it? And so the kid actually has to think. It's the same way with when the kids are friending one another, before you're allowed to friend a person, you have to give a reason. So we have 19 different reasons you want this person to be your friend. All 19 are positive. But again, what we're teaching kids to do is you shouldn't just accept any friend request. There's got to be a reason on why you're accepting this friend. It's, it's just remarkable watching how rapidly the kids change their behavior online. And what's great is every two months, we create these well-being reports for the schools and we get, and schools are reporting that not only is the online behavior uh, positively affected, but just behavior in general. Kids are just nicer and more empathetic towards one another. And that's really what is important to me. I, you know, adults, we have all kinds of problems. We've had a, an entire lifetime where we've become cynical and things like that. I, it, it's a lot tougher to deprogram a person than to get a little kid that's five years old that's just learning about all these things. And believe me, I watch five-year-olds. They learn the technology quicker than you and I would, would learn it. The five-year-olds are amazing. I was watching a, a YouTube video recently, and the kid has a book. He keeps on tapping the book, waiting for it to do something. I'm like, wow, we've come to this where the kids don't even know what a book is. But I, I think it's really important for us to train kids on how to develop these positive habits. And then the other thing I love about the program is like when I was a kid, I wanted to be a, a cop. Well, nowadays, everybody wants to kill the cops. And I'm like, wow, that's such a negative uh, portrayal of law enforcement. And so it's really important to me that education and law enforcement work together. And so one of the questions we ask the kids every day is, well, how do you feel today? And kids are very honest, Aaron. I mean, kids will say exactly how they feel. And if they say they're maybe they're sad or if they're angry, uh, our, our programming, it takes them to a video on and the videos shift all the time. It gives them some coping skills. Here's what you can do when you're angry. But this is what's interesting. We're not going to share individual data for individual students because we actually don't know who the student is. We just have uh, serial numbers for each kid. But what we can do is talk to a law enforcement and say, you know what, this school, 30 percent of the kids are reporting that they're angry. You know, maybe we need to do a, an assembly or something to prevent a school shooting from happening. Let's be a little bit more preventative in, in this country. It's, it, it, it really frightens me that we're not doing things like that. So it's, it's a great way. It's a great tool to teach a lot of the habits that I think you and I were taught a lot of these positive habits when we were young, but we can't make that assumption that every kid's being taught those uh, positive habits. Folks, I want to take just a second to talk about the Beyond Risk and Back Parenting Masterclass. Now, before you fast forward through this, I want to let you know it will be short because I want you to hear this. First of all, the class is $99. Second of all, it's 56 classes on everything from the green, things are going good and we want to make them go great, to the yellow, my kid's at risk and I am worried and I want them to go green, but they could go red and how will I know? And then of course it is for the parents who are dealing with a kid in red, that crisis, that life and limb section. You get all three of those courses for that $99. You watch it at your own pace and it comes with a session with me. Go to brabapp.com. That's B R A B A P P.com. Brab for Beyond Risk and Back. Brabapp.com. 
Let me help you help your kids. I don't think adults practice healthy, positive habits online anymore. You and I were talking about how adults treat each other on online, how they how we bully each other. And I made a off comment about two adults calling each other names and, and wanting to respond. What are you guys, nine years old? And you were like, don't insult the nine year old. <laughs> Yeah, I shared with you, I recently uh, wrote a letter to a major newspaper. They didn't publish it because they're dumb. Uh, but basically, <laughs> they had an article and it said that the president and Congress were behaving like children. And the gist of my uh, editorial, my letter to the editor was that is such an insult to children because kids get over it. I mean, kids, they get in a fight and 10 minutes later, like, this is my best friend. I love that about kids. Adults are the ones that hold grudges. And we were having this conversation. This is the thing with social media I see. It's kind of like when I'm driving and, and somebody just cuts me off. I always wonder, well, would you do that if we were just walking? Would you just push your way in front of me? I bet you you wouldn't because I'm an actual human being to you. It's one thing to have fun and, and call people names online. It's another thing when you realize there's actually another human being on the other end of that. And it's, it's negatively affecting their mental well-being. So I think we have to be considerate of those types of things. You know, I, I was listening to talk radio many, many years ago. It was back in the 90s. And I heard, I wish I could remember the name of this guy, but I heard him arguing with a call-in person who was saying they were an expert in something and that they had written a book about it. And that's why they were an expert. Well, I've written a book about this. And the 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 radio host starts screaming, Writing a book about it doesn't make you an expert. I've got five books. Does that mean I'm an expert in five different things? What are you, crazy? I'm not going to suddenly change my mind because you've written a book. And like that stuck with me because there's, you know, I'm I'm traveling through Mexico right now. I'm I'm in uh, Querétaro and, and it is spectacular. I've been in Guanajuato. I've been in San Miguel de Allende. I've been in Leon. I've, I've been coming across this country by car with my wife. Gorgeous. It's beautiful. The people are the friendliest. I've had no issues. And I feel utterly lied to by the mainstream. But here's the gist of it, doctor, is I don't know where to tell my kid to trust. I, I thought we could trust libraries. And then we put all, everything we've ever written ever in the history, and now everything we've thought is all online. Like the sum total of human knowledge is right here in the palm of our hand. And 30% of it is hardcore pornography. Now, my parents would have never let me go to the library had three out of every 10 books been pornography. And anybody can put anything anywhere. But the truth is, anybody could have written anything. You said earlier, you know, history's written by the conquerors. Eloquence belongs to the conquerors. We know nothing about the Druids except what Caesar told us. That tells us nothing about the Druids. So where do we find truth? How do we, how do we find truth for our children? Can we trust the internet? Can we trust books? Wow, that's a loaded question, Aaron. I'll, I'll attempt as, as much as, I mean, we have to be deeper readers. We have to be critical readers. Uh, just because you read something in one place doesn't make it. And actually, I don't know if there is truth in any form because everybody's always going to have, I mean, we can talk about the uh, Columbus Day. Well, some people are going to praise Columbus as being this incredible explorer. And some people are going to say that uh, he, he just conquered the Native American population, destroyed the Native. I mean, th there's always multiple points of view. I, I loved what you were talking about with Mexico, uh, about how sheltered all of us are. Maybe that's the, the first step is let's stop listening to experts that have never been anywhere. Let's stop. Li, li, I mean, for this radio host to scream at a person that wrote a book, I always I always joke that if you read one book, you're informed. If you read two books, you're an expert. Uh, if you write the book, you're definitely an expert, I would think. I love traveling, just like you. And I was in Bolivia many years ago. Of course, I was hanging out at a pub with a couple of British guys because that's what British 20-year-old guys are all just backpacking around the world. And these two, they were on a walkabout. They'd been traveling for three years and they had been everywhere. I mean, I thought I'd been to, I've been to 63 countries, but I hadn't been to, these guys, they'd been to Serbia, they'd been to Iran, they'd been to Afghanistan, they'd been to Rwanda. Uh, and we were in Bolivia. And at the time, Bolivia was probably one of the poorest countries in all of uh, South America. And this is a true story, Aaron. I asked them, I said, of all of your travels, what's the most dangerous situation you ever felt you were in? They didn't even hesitate, Aaron. They looked at me and they're like, 
Well, one time we took a public bus in Los Angeles. I'm like, oh my gosh, he's talking about my country. And it was interesting because, and think about this, this is again, how things are portrayed to the rest of the world. All of us are dirty, hairy. Every American's armed and dangerous. And I'm like, wow, that's the perception out there. You know, you're in Mexico right now. Oh, everybody thinks the Mexicans are all drug lords and they're trying to come into America and steal our jobs. And, you know, I, I my suggestion to anybody is before you judge others, like why don't you start being around those other people? If you look at, I, mean, I, I live in Los Angeles. I love Los Angeles. You can go around the world in 80 minutes in Los Angeles. Uh, we have our differences, but at least we have a common language, Spanish. But I love it. I love the diversity. And when you get to meet people from different cultures, I'll give you a, an, an example. I, Among my the many hats I wear, I'm a visiting distinguished professor at the American University in Cairo. Say that five times fast. Anyway, when I go to Egypt, I always like to speak to surrounding schools. And so I spoke at this Muslim school. I was doing a parent training. Aaron, two o'clock in the afternoon, 400 parents show up. I couldn't believe it. And it was like the Muslim Brotherhood. All the guys had long beards and all the women were wearing burqas. And wouldn't you know it? We were talking like you and I are talking right now. And I said to myself, shame on me. You know, here's the Christian guy. I was making all these assumptions. And so I started off my presentation. I said, well, I was reading this book. Have any of you ever read the Quran? And so they all laughed. And I said, oh, well, then you know the story when the angel Gabriel appears in the cave to Muhammad. What's the first thing he tells Muhammad to do? Because the first pillar of Islam is to read. And so I looked at all these parents and I said, so not only should we get your kids reading, it's actually written in your most sacred text that it's your duty to get your kids reading. And I had 400 heads nodding and I'm like, holy cow, who would ever have thought this Christian guy, his best audiences are Muslims. I mean, I love going to Islamic schools now. And it took one exposure. I, I had all of these preconceptions and shame on me. You know, and I'm an educated person. Can you think about the ignorant people that aren't educated, that make all these assumptions all the time? I can't even imagine. But all those, so getting around to your question, uh, you know, you have to teach people to be deep thinkers. Just be, it's, I always tell people there's no such thing as fake news. There's people that depend on one news source. You need to listen to different points of view and you don't have to agree with them. I, I never care if people agree with my point of view. I, I just try to teach my students how to be able to listen and respectfully disagree if you disagree with the point. And I, frankly, when we had this conversation, I love being around people that disagree with me all the time. It makes me better. I, I mean, if we were all the same, COVID would have wiped us out. But we're not the same. Thank goodness. We're all a little bit different. So you you bring up a very interesting point because the idea of, you know, diversifying our intake habits of, of information, right? Whether it's a book or whether it's online, there tends to be an algorithm that continues to push the product that we are responding to the most at us. Because the goal of the algorithm is to keep us online. In the same sense that we can say lovingly, your goal is to keep me in a book, to keep me reading, to keep me educating myself, to learning, to have fun to do it. So you're going to push things towards the parents to help this mindset. And we're dealing with a system that by and large, if I am watching, you know, Mexican Vice Squad, then suddenly videos about getting arrested in Mexico are going to pop up on my YouTube feed and suddenly on my Facebook feed and suddenly in my TikTok feed. And how do you encourage someone who's being inundated with negativity? And I'll just use Mexico as an example. How do you encourage someone who's being inundated with negativity around traveling in Mexico to come experience it like I am? And just like you, Danny, as I was, I, we were at a beach town, these two people pulled up in their camper vans, both families from France who shipped their campers to a Alaska drove down from Alaska, Canada, all the way. They're going all the way to the very tip of South America. And that was exactly the question my wife and I asked them. Where's the most dangerous experience you had? They said 16th Street Mall, Denver, Colorado, right? <laughs> they said our children were terrified of that place. They've been everywhere, Canada, America, all the way through Mexico. And it was Denver, Colorado that the children couldn't sleep and cried all night. So how do we, how do we teach the children to crack the paradigm of the algorithm or to at least not buy in to the basic news source? 
frankly, I don't think news is the best way to evaluate any kind of society. That's why their books are written. I, I always love to play devil's advocate with my students. And so I was actually just working with a class of uh, middle schoolers uh, about a month ago. And we were talking about the first Persian Gulf War. I was talking about, I'm like, oh my gosh, did you know we lost 5,000 troops in the Persian Gulf War. And we talked about that for about 10 minutes. And then, you know, every, I was getting everybody built up. And I said, okay, did you know that over a million civilians in Iraq died in that war? Well, now it gets different. Now all of a sudden the kids are like, what? And I'm like, I, I'm telling you that there's different points of view out there. We have to look at these different points of view. You know, uh, if you're going to look at Islamic terrorism, I'm like, well, Let's look at Christian terrorism over the years. There's been quite a few. I mean, the Crusades, they did a pretty good job of killing a lot of people during the Crusades in the name of God. Let's not put one religion over another. I mean, I, 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 I want an actual uh, respectful debate. And this is where I love the Internet is because now kids not only are you going to be able to find articles like I'm constantly showing interviews of people from around the world. Now, I mean, look, at you're in Mexico right now. And you and I have no problem communicating. That's what I learned during COVID. I, I would do interviews all day long. I had like one in one day, I had an interview in South Carolina, Nepal, and Nigeria. And I was like, holy cow, that is so cool without leaving my house. And, uh, you know, this is this is where I get, a, you know, everybody talks about the doom and gloom. I'm a, I'm a little bit different than most people. I look at the positives and things. I Here's what I get excited about with technology. Right now, Aaron, there's some barefoot kid. Let's say he's in Cambodia. Maybe he didn't have breakfast. He's on a dirt floor. But if that kid has an internet connection and a laptop, that kid has exact same access as the head of Google. The world just got a whole lot smaller and... I'm, I'm excited because I know that one of these places that nobody pays attention to, there's a person that's growing up right now that's going to figure out the cure to cancer. And there's another person that's going to figure out, okay, I know how to stop all these greenhouse gases from uh, uh, destroying the plant. I mean, I get so excited thinking about that. And being, but you want to be around people. I mean, if you're going to read a book, uh, anything that Peter Diamandis writes, I love that guy. He's got a great book called Abundance. And it basically, every chapter is talking about a different uh, area that people think is going down the toilet. You know, he's talking about um, people, oh, we don't have enough land anymore for uh, for crops. We're, everybody's going to starve to death. And he has a whole chapter on how in China they've built skyscrapers 100, acre, 100 uh, stories high that actually have crops being grown vertically. In, I'm like, who thought of that? That's amazing. You got people that are looking at different renewable resources. I mean, I, I, I point that out to my students. I'm like, you know, one of the biggest uh, environmental catastrophes in world history was in the 1890s because horses were, the average horse in America would urinate like, I think it was like three gallons of urine every single day. And they were, their number twos, there was like pounds of number twos. It was causing all kinds of environmental problems. And then the horses would die and they'd leave these dead horses in the street. And so they actually had the first environmental conference in New York City. I think it was in 1896. And they were trying to figure out how to solve the problem of the horses. And one guy solved the crisis. His name was Henry Ford. And he invented the automobile. And no longer were horses everywhere. And, and right now, but oh, I am completely convinced there's somebody out there that's going to fix. This is why I'm an optimist. If there was an asteroid coming to destroy the planet right now, I guarantee you, Russia, China, and America would fit. We'd get our best minds together. We'd work together, and we would destroy that asteroid. It's amazing when you. I mean, I, it really, it really is. I, I, you know, with the last UFO congressional hearings that just took place, and then they happened immediately after, right here in Mexico. And there's a big thing all over the internet about how the Mexican government paraded out these two alien bodies that they've had in. And of course, now everybody's speculating: Are they real? Are they not real? Was the American congressional hearings that happened less than a month ago was it a dog and pony show and everything like that? But I am also convinced that. All all of a sudden, if the big mothership appeared in our skies, we'd all become best friends really fast and figure this out together. So, Doctor, what I'm hearing you saying is that the sum total of human knowledge being available to all of us right now at the tip of our fingers in our hand is not the problem. So how do parents teach Internet emotional intelligence. What is this? Yeah, 
uh, one of my friends, Bob, Bob Teed, uh, his last name, T-I-E-D-E, he's got a whole bunch of books out about the importance of asking questions. I have a question on a post-it taped to my desk right over there. And here's what the question is. What if I'm wrong? I look at that every single day because just when we think we know something, it turns out we don't know. I mean, and you know, now, now that I'm married and I'm a father, I, I realize every day I don't know anything. But it, it, it's fascinating. I, I think, and that's what I, that's what I love about teaching little kids is because they're so excited to learn about new things. And I don't see many little kids taking a stern position because they don't have positions. They're just open to a lot of things. And I love that. That's what learn. I mean, and it's, it's actually kind of freaky group think. I mean, they've done studies on this. Uh, there's a great study. It was in, I think it was in one of the Malcolm Gladwell books. I don't remember which one, but it was on jury selection. And so they'd have eight actors and one person was not the actor. And so the eight actors would agree on something ridiculous, like two plus two equals three. And in, it was like 80% of the time, the person that wasn't an actor would just agree with the other eight. Well, so then, so that was the control group. And then the experimental group, they'd have eight actors again, but one of the actors would say, no, two plus two doesn't equal three, it equals four. All it took was the one person. And it was, it was like, only 4% of the time, the person, the other, the non-actor would actually agree with the jury. And what I thought was great about that study is it shows the power of groupthink, but it also shows the power of all it takes is one person to stand up to something to get people thinking differently. I mean, you know, who was it? Galileo was the guy that was going to be burned to death because he believed that the earth revolved around the sun, not the other way around. I mean, oh, heresy, heresy, burn him, burn him. <laughs> But what do we know? It's kind of like you were just talking about the UFO hearings. I mean, I don't believe in UFOs, but if a person says they believe in UFOs to me, I'd be like, well, give me, why do you think that? This is what I do with kids all the time. Why do you think that? Support your argument. And the the nice thing about, my wife will tell you, the nice thing about me is I'll probably disagree with you, but I'll think about it. If you can actually convince me of something, it usually only takes me a couple of days to think about something. Oh, that's a better way. That's a better way. You know, and I really just wish everybody was a little bit more open to, to things like that. This is what I'm really trying to teach students is I, I'm not going to teach you what to think. I'm going to teach you how to think. And it's very important to me that you're very critical. And just because you saw something, I mean, I do this even to this day. People give statistics all the time. And I'm like, I've heard that statistic. Do you know where it comes from? I mean, I've heard the statistic for years. They say, oh, we are able, based on third grade reading scores, we're able to determine the number of prisons to make. I love that. That's incredible. I'm like, wow, that shows the importance of reading. Can you show me that study? Because I can't find it. I've looked for years. I've been looking for this study. There's all kinds of things that are being taught all the time. I'm like, but is there actual research? I mean, just because it's been said many times, let's actually look at it. Is there actual research on that? And I think that's important is to support your position with research. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it's literally when a concept becomes symbolic rather than factual, right? And then symbols can be signposts to truth, but that doesn't mean that they're the truth. It means that they're a symbol of a truth, a truth. Now, I, I, something you had you had said earlier suddenly sparked a memory. You know, they were trying to get adults to stop eating tur turtles in Costa Rica, and the the adults just weren't having it. It was embedded in their culture, so they taught the children about turtle meat, and the children had the adults done eating within one decade. It was over, and it's because they the children were reached. Th that could be something that could make an adult afraid. If the children have that much pur purchasing power, not just at the store, but in their own parents' hearts, if if you can't convince, if an adult can't convince grandma to stop eating turtles, but granddaughter can, then we go to the children. And children are so easily influenced. Thus, the cyberbullying, the the pedophiles online, these topics that are so worrisome. Yeah, I remember when I was a kid in the 80s, they'd have all, you know, it was Nancy Reagan's Just Say No campaign. They had all these uh, campaign ads. But the one I always remembered was this dad's confronting his son. He's found some marijuana in his room. And he's like, where'd you learn how to do this? Where'd you learn how to do this? And the kid's finally fed up. He's like, you, dad, I learned it from you. And I was like, Oh, gotcha. And I'll never forget that. I mean, I remember that one. Every now and then, I the, the, this is why I always tell people, watch some of these advertisements. They're very they're very clever the way they do things. Um, 
I remember the smoking. A lot of people wouldn't quit smoking. And the, the most effective ads to me about the people not smoking was they'd have the guy and he's like, I smoked for 30 years. And I didn't realize there was such a thing called side stream. And my wife died because of the side stream from my smoke. And he's like in tears. He's like, I lost my wife because I killed my wife. And I was like, wow, that's a powerful ad. Is It's not just, just stop smoking for you. It's just stop smoking for the people around you. I was like, that's very powerful. I mean, uh, gosh, it may have been one of the Jonah Berger. Jonah Berger is a great author, too. He writes books like uh, Contagious was one of the ones I, I read. I loved. Uh, he's a professor at... Uh, UPenn, I think they're all at UPenn now. And uh, he had a story about they were trying to stop littering in Texas and they couldn't figure it out because, you know, they're like, oh, you get these big bubbas drinking their beers and throwing them out of uh, their truck windows. And so some ingenious marketer came up with the slogan, don't mess with Texas. Hey, Texas, we're proud. You know, we drink our beer, but we throw it away. And it appealed directly to the group that was responsible for the polluting and don't mess with texas is like one of the most pop one of the most successful ads campaigns ever like pollution in texas went down the toilet once uh once they said don't mess with texas they, they gave you an identity i thought wow that's fast i just love psychology it's, i'm always looking for this with the kids i mean like for parents out there i'm like oh if you want your if you really want your kid to do something just tell them they can't do it i mean that's what I used to do all the time with my students. I'm like, hey, today I'm going to read to you. Uh, oh, I can't read this book. On the back cover, it says it's for grade 3.2. We're only first graders. This is too tough for us. I'll put it here on my desk. If anybody, want, anybody wants to try it, you know, guess which book the kids are all going to go for? That one. They want to prove to me that they can read it. <laughs> what is your number one? You've done enough parenting talks and workshops and coaching about reading and information and critical thinking. What's your number one most favorite bit of advice to give parents? Well, I love the subtitles because people don't realize that, uh, you know, I always tell people, turn on the subtitles on the TV. So, and they'll say, well, wait a second, the show's in English and the subtitles are in English. What good does that do? I'm like, well, that's fair. But let me ask you this. Have you ever watched a show with subtitles and not looked at the subtitles? It's very difficult to do. Your your brain is directed towards that text, and there's lots of research to support this. Another thing that I always tell parents, uh, I have three kids of my own, so it's and they're all completely different, and uh, I have the same struggles as any parent, and it's all about establishing habits. And so I have a feeling television is here to stay, electronic media is here to stay, and so I've always had a rule with my kids. You can turn on the TV, you can turn on your device, but you got to bring me something to read is the price of admission. And so when the kids were little, they'd bring me like a children's picture book, a Berenstain's Bear book or something. We'd read that and then they could turn on the TV. Now I have three teenagers and they'll usually bring me their iPad and it'll have some article about, um, you know, a Florida man did some stupid thing or uh, something, something silly. Uh, and we'll read that and then they'll go online. It's interesting. They're very different than when we grew up, Aaron, like TV's no longer what dominates them. Now they're on their phones, just checking out YouTube videos all the time. And I love that. I, I, I'm like, this is great. You can watch them, but we're putting on the subtitles. But so subtitles is one. The second one, though, is the price of admission is uh, you have to bring me something to read. And then that kind of leads to number three. I have a wife and three kids and we do book dates once a week. And so I have different books with everybody in my family. So my oldest daughter, she's in college now and she likes the Game of Thrones uh, TV show. So we're reading uh, I can it, Fire and I, I, Land of Fire and Ice or what, um, by George R.R. R. Martin. We're, so we're reading, we're reading those books. I, I, I'm not a huge fan of the language and some of the situations in it, but hey, it's her book. All right, we'll do it. Uh, my son, he loves anything to do with... Uh, the military. And so we're almost finished with one of my favorite books of all time, The Killer Angels by Michael Shira about the Battle of Gettysburg. I mean, if somebody had given me this book in high school, I would have been an American history major. It's about the it's about the Battle of Gettysburg, and it's from the points of view of northern and southern uh, commanders. And it's incredible. I, I've given that book to at least a thousand people of all different races, sizes, genders, everything. And all of them will say it's one of the top five books I've ever read. Michael Sherry won the Pulitzer Prize in 1973. My youngest daughter, for some reason, she likes literature. And so, uh, we just read the great Gatsby. I hate that book, but after reading it to her, I'm like, okay, 
I get it now. I mean, it's very well written. I hate the story, but she likes the story. She, it's all right. It's very well written. And then um, my wife and I, um, we had re- we finished all the Outlander books by Diana Gabaldon. And now we're reading this series I loved called uh, The Unselected Journals of Emma M. Lyon by Beth Brower. And they're just so nice. And it's the characters. It's, I mean, it's just like Elizabethan period. It sounds pathetic that a guy that I'm like a football guy and I love these Elizabethan, uh, you know, women drinking tea or whatever. But it's about this uh, young girl and her three best friends are all these guys. It's like this great. Fr- I have no idea how this hasn't been bought as a Hollywood movie. It's it's an incredible series. And uh, it, yeah. So so the point there is with the different loved ones in your life you should have something that is your treat with them. It doesn't have to be a book too. And this is what you said at the beginning of the podcast. One of my problems with literacy is everybody thinks if you're not reading literature, you're not reading. I'm like, well, who said that, you know, because it's Dostoevsky, it's a real book, but it, it, Sports Illustrated doesn't count. I mean, some of the best authors I've ever read are Sports Illustrated authors. Uh, you know, uh, you can read all kinds of things that, you know, I mean, it doesn't even have to be, like a story. I actually like reading technical announcements and trying to figure out, wow, why is this one so much more interesting than this one? You know, uh, Einstein, I had seen the movie Oppenheimer and uh, it got me reading more about Einstein. And I think that Einstein, yes, he was brilliant, but I think what really separated Einstein from most of these scientists was his ability to communicate complex ideas to people like you and me. We're like, oh, that's what he meant by that. I mean, that's that's a difficult thing to do. Uh, and so uh, those, those are my, those are three, three tips, three of my favorites. Before there's ever correction, there's connection. And that's what I believe your work has done, doctor. And so thank you again for being on the show. Before we sign off, how are people going to follow up with you? Give them, give them the, the link tree, please, right now. Give, give me the laundry list. If you go to freegiftfromdanny.com, again, freegiftfromdanny.com, I'll send everybody a couple of freebies. First of all, I'll give everybody an e-copy of my book, Read, Lead, and Succeed. This is a book I wrote for a school principal who's trying to keep his faculty and staff positively engaged. So I said, okay, I'll write you a book. So every week I give you a concept, an inspirational quote, an inspirational story, A book recommendation on a book you should read, but you're probably too lazy because you're an adult. So I also give you a children's picture book recommendation, demonstrates the same concept. You can read that in five minutes. And I'm also going to give everybody access to a five-day reading challenge I did online for about 700 parents, where every day for five consecutive days for an hour, I give all kinds of different strategies to get your kids excited about reading. Because the more excited you are to read, the more likely you are to read. And the more you read, the better you get. As always, I want to thank uh, Dr. Brassell for his appearance on the show. The guy is a genius. It's amazing. Go to free, uh, free gift from Danny. Well, we have the link below here in the show notes. So go there, get in contact, be in connection with this guy and his brilliance and the work that he's doing. And if you have a kid between five and 12 years old, uh, let's make sure you get your hands on that uh that program danny what's that called again cybersmarties.com cybersmarties.com it's around the world because i know you have listeners around the world um um, cybersmarties.com get your kid over to cybersmarties.com you get over there make sure you vet the product as you should vet everything your kids are doing online parents take care of yourselves first your adult relationship second and your children third That's how you're going to do your best work with your children. Big love to Deepin Productions for producing this show and making it sound good. I'll see you next week on Beyond Risk and back.